Hello everyone. Uh, merci Catherine uh, for the invitation. It's very nice. I'm happy to be here. And congratulations to even manage to have a nice weather uh, for two days. Uh, that's uh, quite remarkable. Uh, and congratulations to all of you for staying until the last talk. I very much uh, appreciate it. So I'm going to tell you uh, about uh, two parts. Uh, the first part, I will, uh, I will not dwell too much on the impacts of climate change on the, the ocean, but I will uh, try to uh, show that the ocean uh, can provide uh, measures, uh, perhaps solutions, to minimize the impacts of climate change and uh, its, and, uh, its uh, consequences. And in the second part, I will tell you about uh, a paper that uh, was published two years ago on uh, rebuilding marine life. So let's see how that works. So the, um, this is, uh, these are figures uh, taken from uh, the IPCC AR6 uh, report, Group 1, uh, showing the main um, changes uh, observed so far and the ones which are expected in the future depending on several uh, scenarios. Um, the color coding is always the same. Uh, the red one is uh, the, uh, uh, a scenario that is called, uh, used to be called uh, business as usual, but it is not, no longer business as usual. We are no longer on this track. And the blue one is uh, a scenario uh, compatible with the Paris Agreement. Um, so you see that, uh, pff, like uh, my predecessors, I am a bit confused with this. Uh, um, as you see, there are many um, changes which have already occurred. For example, here is the global ocean content, uh, heat content. Uh, the ocean stores uh, more than 90% of the extra heat generated by uh, the increase in greenhouse gases, and uh, it is going. It is bound to increase uh, a lot uh, in the in the future. Together with that, marine heat waves uh, have uh, doubled uh, in the past uh, three decades, and they could uh, increase uh, much more in the in the future. The, the oxygen is also losing oxygen. Um, Ocean acidification uh, is also has also already occurred, increased by 30 percent, um, and uh, it's going to uh, continue unless uh, the Paris Agreement is fully implemented. You see that uh, the future ocean is really in our hands. I mean, uh, there is a way to, for example, stop uh, completely uh, uh, ocean acidification. It will take many centuries <coughs> to go back to the previous ocean pH, but at least uh, the, this uh, long-term decrease uh, will be, uh, we have a chance to uh, stop it. There is also um, this uh, sea level rise is, uh, of course, a major um, change uh, occurring in the ocean uh, due to both uh, the fresh water coming from <coughs> glaciers and the melting of glaciers and ice caps with um, uh, a, an increase in sea level, which could uh, reach uh, one <coughs> meter by 2100. Uh, but uh, working group one of the IPCC says that uh, much greater sea level rise cannot be excluded. It is not excluded that uh, sea level rise could go several meters, uh, six, seven uh, meters. Uh, that is something that is possible. So making the case uh, for the ocean, uh, of course, there are many dramatic news uh, about uh, the impacts of climate change and other uh, processes that uh, stressors that affect uh, oceans and uh, ecosystems. Many extinct uh, species in historic times, um, several species listed by IUCN of uh, conservation con concern, um, a large decline in exploited uh, marine megafauna. Um, many fisheries are overexploited. Uh, many fisheries are uh, below targets, loss of biomass of fish stocks, 
And in, for the habitats, it's uh, quite uh, dramatic, including for uh, the so-called uh, blue carbon habitats, mangroves, uh, seagrass uh, areas, tidal flats, oyster reefs, which have al almost completely disappeared, um, salt marshes and coral reefs. So the, the news are grim, but there is uh, some uh, ray of hope. Um, first of all, the, uh, the elephant in the room is really climate change. I mean, um, but uh, we know uh, from uh, the IPCC work uh, that uh, we know uh, what uh, needs to be done. Uh, we know in f for a large part uh, uh, the processes that uh, can be uh, implemented to uh, um, make sure that the Paris Agreement is in fact implemented. It was a great news, but unfortunately it, its implementation is very slow. Uh, so the Paris Agreement has the uh, potential to avoid the unmanageable, but we must manage wh what is inevitable, uh, because uh, we are on track for, for sea level rise, for example, there is no hope uh, to contain sea level rise. So the adaptation and mitigation is our two uh, processes that need to be uh, uh, implemented. So. As I will try to show, uh, the ocean has uh, the potential to help humanity to mitigate and adapt. Uh, and uh, I will provide some uh, very quick overview on that. First of all, uh, for mitigation, uh, there is uh, undoubtedly a need for negative emissions. Uh, the Paris Agreement has this objective to limit uh, the increase in uh, global temperature to below 2 degrees and as close as possible to 1.5 degrees. Um, that means that uh, there is, uh, this is, these are uh, emissions of greenhouse gases and this is removal of greenhouse gases. We are around here now. Um, the gross emissions need to go down um, but it's impossible to completely stop uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions because there are some sectors that cannot be decarbonized. So there is a need to, um, uh, on top of the natural uh, systems that uh, remove uh, carbon from the atmosphere, there is a need to uh, have human-made carbon removal. And some of those techniques are envisaged for, uh, for the ocean, although we are very uh, concerned uh, about the negative consequences of uh, ocean-based uh, carbon removal. So uh, there is a need to be uh, uh, net zero uh, emissions in uh, 2050 and to have net negative emissions uh, thereafter. So how can we do that? And how, how are we doing with this objective? These are uh, the global uh, CO2 emissions uh, between uh, 2000 and 2100. Uh, several models uh, considered by the IPCC, and as I said, uh, there is a need to be uh, net, net negative after in the second half of this uh, century. Uh, and there are models uh, that show it is possible, but those models are based on assumptions that so far Nobody knows how to implement uh, those uh, measures uh, like carbon dioxide removal. That is a, a very big uh, concern. So it works on paper, but how to implement that is, uh, is a different story. And there is a gap uh, that the UNEP calls the emission gap. Um, in 2030, we, uh, that's where we need to go. That's where the 2010 policies uh, were uh, putting us uh, in terms of uh, CO2 emissions. Uh, so the, there is some uh, climate action, because now we are uh, right here with the current policies. And uh, within uh, the, the UNFCCC uh, negotiations on climate, uh, countries have uh, provided their policies uh, called the NDCs. And uh, those NDCs are very timid. They will not do so far a big uh, difference. And to get to 1.5 degrees, this is where we need to go. Uh, so that's a big gap uh, in emissions. So the, the scale of uh, CO2 removal is truly gigantic. Uh, 
the two reports of the IPCC, the 1.5 report in 2018, uh, mentioned the fact that by 2100, one, need, one needs to remove uh, from the atmosphere 100 to 1,000 gigatons of CO2. The point is that nobody knows how to do that. Uh, there are some prospects, some uh, uh, hope, uh, but, uh, and I will come to that, but so far, uh, nobody knows, either on land or the, in the ocean. Uh, the Working Group 3 report, which was published in April that, this, this year, uh, says that indeed CO2 removal is an essential element of, uh, to limit warming, um, but it cannot serve carbon dioxide removal uh, as a substitute to deep decarbonization of, uh, of our societies. And in this context, uh, coastal and uh, open ocean is, uh, ex are ex extremely attractive because uh, for carbon dioxide removal, for example, um, um, uh, BEX, the bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, there are very big constraints uh, because using plants on land, uh, that means entering into competition with agriculture and food security. Uh, there is also a limit on water uh, on fertilizers, uh, so the constraints are multiple on land. Uh, the ocean has a very large potential for uh, storing carbon um, because of its uh, huge surface area, and of course CO2 goes uh, through a surface, uh, the surface of the ocean, so, and the volume is gigantic, and also the ocean has chemical characteristics that uh, enable to store a lot of carbon. Uh, not on, in the form of CO2, but in the form of bicarbonate. Um, so we have uh, studied several, um, we have assessed several of those measures, produced uh, policy briefs uh, uh, that we present uh, we, inside events at COP uh, meetings of uh, UNFCCC, and also some of the, uh, the recent IPCC reports uh, include uh, lots of uh, those results. Uh, um, so there is a lot of uh, information uh, about uh, that. And this is a summary slide of uh, the measures that can be, these are measures that we do not endorse. Um, we have tried to assess the measures that have been put on the table. And in fact, uh, several of them are really problematic. Um, and so there are four groups of, uh, of um, ocean-based measures. The first one is addressing the causes of climate change, of course. Uh, I cannot go through all the details, but some of them are uh, nature-based solutions, and uh, we have heard uh, at this meeting uh, several times about uh, the restoration and increase in coastal vegetation. Uh, marine renewable energy is, uh, is a key uh, ocean-based measures measure that uh, is uh, quite well implemented in the UK, for example, and France is lagging behind. And there are geoengineering approaches, uh, such as uh, fertilizing the ocean uh, with iron, for example, or uh, uh, providing alkalinity uh, to the ocean to counteract ocean acidification and also to store carbon in the form of uh, bicarbonate. The second group is uh, supporting uh, biological and ecological adaptation, um, reducing pollution, of course, uh, marine protected areas, uh, providing hopefully some more resilience to climate change and its impacts, restoration and enhancement of uh, habitats, and assisted evolution, uh, which has also been described as a potential measure. Then there are the uh, measures to enhance uh, societal adaptation. Several of them, uh, some of them are really uh, sad uh, measures, relocating people, for example, from uh, Pacific Islands, uh, atolls which will be underwater uh, some, sometime in the next uh, decades, um, relocating uh, economic activities, Infrastructure-based adaptation, we heard about the ocean sprawl, but uh, dikes uh, are a way to protect uh, the coast from uh, sea level rise and storms. And uh, finally, uh, solar radiation management. Some of those measures can be implemented um, in the ocean, 
cloud, cloud brightening in order to increase uh, the reflectivity of uh, clouds um, by spraying uh, seawater in the atmosphere and increasing nebulosity and also increasing the surface albedo enhancement. Some of those methods are a little crazy, like uh, depositing foam at the surface of the ocean to avoid warming the ocean. You can find it stupid, I do too, um, but these are, have been um, described in the literature. So what we have done is uh, assessing using various criteria, effectiveness, uh, co-benefits, uh, negative uh, um, impacts, and uh, seven criteria that we used. Um, to, um, and we have built uh, uh, clusters of measures, decisive, low regret, unproven, and risky. Again, I don't have the time to go through all of that. Um, and of course, we, uh, we strongly advise to uh, implement decisive measures, for example, marine renewable energy, carbon capture and storage, infrastructure-based adaptation. You may be uh, puzzled by the fact that you can find two colors uh, because it depends on local conditions. Sometimes building a dike is very, a very good measure to protect uh, coastal assets. At other times, it's a disastrous uh, measure because it uh, provides erosion in one part and uh, high sedimentation uh, downstream. So that's why sometimes we, we, we do see two colors. Uh, unproven measures are measures that uh, seem to work on paper. Models show that uh, it has potential, like ocean alkalinization. Um, and the risky measures are those which are currently also at concept stage, and we do find there are many, many um, disbenefits, uh, and that is, uh, for example, uh, solar radiation management. I didn't uh, mention this one, the low regret measures. These are measures that have uh, very little effectiveness to, uh, uh, to mitigate, for example, and uh, in this uh, low regret uh, measure, we put restoration of uh, blue carbon ecosystems. It has a very small impact on uh, CO2 uptake, but they have so many benefits, co-benefits, protect, uh, Philippe Potin mentioned that, uh, protecting the, the land from, uh, from storms, uh, for food security, for many, uh, maintaining biodiversity for many reasons. So, the, so there are low regret and uh, they should be implemented. We know how to do that and we should uh, do that by all means. Um, I like this expression of blue acceleration. It's quite amazing here. Uh, you see that uh, how the ocean and the use of the ocean has changed in recent uh, decades. It's quite uh, stunning. Uh, some of those um, changes are good. For example, more data in the World Ocean Database. That's, uh, that's very good. That is in this increase in uh, uh, observations. Um, uh, marine aquaculture, um, uh, the use of uh, seawater to produce uh, fresh water, uh, the concern of uh, deep sea minerals, uh, that is also a, a concern. Um, the offshore wind, wind farms, that's uh, pretty good news. The increase in tourism, which is not always very beneficial. Um, so the, the ocean is changing very fast. And um, in this paper, uh, led by uh, Carlos Duarte, we have tried to uh, identify the good news in terms, in terms of marine biodiversity. And uh, this was a, a little provocative paper. Um, and I will show you why uh, there is uh, some hope uh, if we do things right. Of course, uh, rebidding marine life in this case is more at the scale of habitats, um, of uh, some uh, megafauna, uh, as you will see in the following slides. So there is no shortage of bad news uh, and um, negative uh, perception of uh, changes in the ocean and, and for the future of the ocean. Will uh, the ocean become uh, uh, slimy? Uh, and is it possible to recover? Uh, this is Jeremy Jackson um, 
view, and also the increasing use of uh, of the ocean from uh, you know ancient times uh, to the future, where the ocean will be increasingly used uh, to generate energy for fishing, for aquaculture. So those, uh, but beside uh, those pessimistic, pessimistic views, some good news can be found. For example, uh, for uh, mammals, uh, the depletion of whales, the unpacked whales, uh, which uh, have been severely uh, exploited, and they were from a population of uh, 50,000 uh, individuals, it was down to uh, a few hundreds in, uh, in the 70s. And uh, here, Victor Smetashek, he not only worked on diatoms, but also on whales, uh, uh, showed that uh, you know, once a population became depleted, other whales were uh, hunted until depletion. And then you see this series of uh, uh, species being exploited. The recovery for the impact whales has been spectacular. Um, it is now estimated that it is more than 50% of uh, the population in 1940. And the IUCN has degraded, uh, or that's which is good news, downlisted, I should say, uh, impact whales from vulnerable to least concern, uh, which shows that really using good governance, there is a way to uh, overcome uh, this uh, decrease in uh, marine mammals. And out of uh, nearly 100 uh, marine mammals, mammal population, 42% have increased in recent times, only 10% have decreased, and the remainder didn't change. Another example of uh, potential uh, good news uh, uh, for uh, rebuilding marine life, and in this, in this case, marine habitats, is the rest restoration of the mangrove in the Mekong Delta. More than 50%, almost 60% of the mangrove uh, in Vietnam and in, in, in Cambodia, uh, in the mangrove uh, in the Mekong Delta, was destroyed during the uh, Vietnam War. By the way, the Vietnamese call it the American War, um, by the use of napalm. So here is an example of a mangrove, 1972, nothing left everything destroyed. And uh, between uh, 1978 and 1998, uh, 2,700 square kilometers of mangroves were replanted to a very big success. Uh, this is a photograph of an example of a mangrove which has been restored. And uh, what is also quite good news is the fact that uh, the carbon storage of those restored mangroves is about the same as the natural mangrove. There is uh, something that is not shown on this uh, slide, but the, the diversity of mangrove trees is less, of course, because they used mostly one uh, species of, uh, of mangrove. But the carbon storage, that's a blue carbon ecosystem, is about the same. Salt marsh restoration is also well uh, known how to implement, and it, wo it works uh, very well, um, very fast. Here an example in San Francisco Bay. Uh, here on top, um, there is no salt marsh anymore, no plants left. And at the bottom, within 10 years, uh, this uh, salt marsh has been uh, fully restored. Um, so it shows that uh, here again, uh, there is a way to overcome the continuous degradation of this habitat. Another uh, example of, uh, it's not really a restoration, but it shows the potential for resilience. I, I used to work on coral reefs, and I did my PhD on corals. Uh, so this uh, speaks a lot to me. Uh, these examples of uh, nuclear testing in the Marshall Islands uh, by the US uh, has damaged considerably, uh, of course, uh, those atolls, and uh, here it's a Bikini at Atoll, um, with surface water in excess of uh, uh, 50,000 degrees, um, blast waves, uh, shock waves, and uh, 
the full coral reef, of course, in the atoll has been eliminated. But within 40 years, uh, corals are back. The reef is back. People are back also. Um, they, in those atolls, they, they, the native population had been evacuated. And um, of course, the diversity is no longer the same. But who knows what happens in the future? Maybe um, there is a strong connectivity uh, among those atolls. And uh, perhaps there is a potential to uh, regain uh, diversity. So there is no single solution to um, recovering uh, marine life um, to, to achieve uh, substantial recovery. And uh, we think that there are five what we call recovery wedges. Um, it is stacking those wedges that uh, could help uh, uh, recovery. The first one is protecting uh, vulnerable habitats and, uh, and species, adopting a cautionary harvesti uh, harvesting uh, strategies, and it worked very well for mammals. We know it worked well for uh, commercial fisheries. Uh, we see that the EU has done some very strong uh, policies uh, which have been very beneficial to fisheries, restoring habitats, uh, reducing pollution and mitigating climate change. This is really uh, uh, the key aspect, uh, I think. So um, the contribution of those wedges uh, is varies across uh, species and habitats. Uh, for example, for coral reefs, um, it is absolutely necessary to uh, stop uh, warming of the of the ocean. We know that uh, coral reefs are susceptible to coral bleaching <coughs> and uh, with um, very bad uh, uh, projections, um, but um, so climate change for that, it's a critical wage for uh, coral reefs uh, ecosystems. Uh, whereas uh, improving habitat protection and fisheries management uh, are critical wages for fisheries, uh, marine uh, vertebrates and the deep sea. There are many roadblocks <laughs> along the way. Um, the first one is climate change. I mean, it's absolutely uh, critical to uh, implement uh, the Paris Agreement and to uh, reduce the gap between the targets and uh, the projected emissions. It is challenging, but it is possible. Um, one needs to consider unavoidable impacts, the impacts that already we are committed to. Um, Natural variability and identification of uh, extremes like marine heat waves need to be also considered. Um, and uh, a roadblock will be the failure to uh, reduce the pressure of other variables uh, than climate uh, variables. Unexpected natural and uh, social events. And uh, finally, growing population will, which will increase uh, the need for for uh, seafood, uh, coastal space, and other uh, ocean uh, resources. So um, substantial to complete recovery, uh, at least at the macro level, uh, uh, that is a 60 to 100% increase relative to uh, the present, uh, appears realistic for most uh, components. And substantial recovery uh, is probably uh, possible for habitats where the slow uh, recovery, I'm talking about coral reefs, and uh, uh, is also um, uh, possible. This comes with uh, necessary investments, and uh, in, uh, the, in the paper we had um, experts on, uh, on uh, the economics, uh, and uh, it shows that uh, this, they say that uh, 10, with 10 to 20 billion dollars a year, uh, for conservation and protection of 50% of the ocean space uh, is needed, plus substantial funds for uh, restoration. Um, the benefits are really considerable. Um, it is estimated that uh, for one dollar invested, one get ten dollars back, and there are not many investments where you get ten times your, uh, mon your money back in excess of one million jobs uh, to be uh, created. 
Rebuilding fish stocks, as I said, uh, can be made by um, uh, market-based instruments, uh, like is done in some of, for some of the EU uh, fisheries. Recreational fishery must also be considered. Uh, the benefit to the uh, aquaculture industry, the global seafood industry, I should say, is uh, really uh, impressive, 53 billion US dollars. And something I was not aware of, but uh, diminishing the, the, uh, the pressure on uh, fish stocks would increase fish yields. Uh, and this is something that is quite counterintuitive. Would increase fish yield by 15% uh, and profit by about uh, 80%. Conserving coastal wetlands due to their uh, uh, protection uh, effect on the, on the coastline and protecting from erosion <coughs> would save uh, the insurance industry billions of dollars. Uh, that's a really a big expense for the uh, insurance industry to, um, uh, to compensate for uh, the destructions caused by uh, submersions, storms, uh, cyclones, etc. And ecotourism in protected areas is, uh, is also a very big asset. So the key messages, uh, I'm sure you are convinced that the ocean is the key element of, of, of our life uh, support system, and that ocean-based actions can maintain or increase uh, those services des despite uh, climate change. Those measures cover both mitigation and adaptation and range across uh, four clusters, decisive, low regret, unproven, and risky. So advancing knowledge on ocean-based solutions is timely ahead of uh, COP26, uh, um, uh, COP27 actually, uh, that's uh, next, uh, next month. I will, I will be uh, in Sharm el for uh, trying to promote uh, conservation protection and the use uh, of the ocean in a wise way. And NDCs, NDCs uh, maybe if you're not familiar, are nationally determined contributions. Uh, uh, that is, uh, before uh, the Paris uh, climate uh, meeting in 2015, countries had to provide uh, their plans for the future in terms of mitigation and adaptation. And those are called nationally determined contributions. It is a bottom-up approach, which was uh, very cleverly uh, done by the French diplomatic service because the previous approach was top-down. That was the Kyoto Protocol, telling countries you need to decrease your emissions by 20%, 15%, or 30%. And this didn't work. In fact, the Kyoto Protocol has not even, even been ratified by the US. So in 2015, there was this reversal instead of top-down, bottom-up, asking countries, what can you do for the common benefit of, the, of humanity? But as I said, so far, the NDCs are very timid, uh, have low ambition. Uh, they should, uh, we think that they should pr prioritize concerning the ocean, the decisive and the low regret measures, uh, improving knowledge on the unproven uh, measures, and very cautiously think about um, the risky measures. And overall, uh, rebuilding uh, marine life, marine habitats, uh, is a doable grand challenge for humanity. It's a, an ethical um, uh, thing to do. It is also uh, financially, and from an economic perspective, very uh, wise um, for um, having a sustainable uh, future. Thank you very much. So many thanks for this awful ambition. Question? Yeah. Um, thank you, Jean-Pierre. I would love to be uh, as optim optimistic as you are. But I mean, how, how do you see this? Uh, because all the um, uh, mitigation, uh, the most realistic mitigation uh, um, solution that you uh, showed are all um, on the um, reducing the, the sources, right? But the sink for the CO2. I mean, I don't see any, any um, realistic uh, options. So uh, 
and, 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 we, and you demonstrated that we need also to increase the sink, right? So, there, so how do you see that? What's well, some of those measures I listed are uh, to uh, have uh, the objective of increasing the sink, uh, like uh, restoring uh, coastal vegetation, also fertilization. Of course, th there is a lot of uh, concern about ocean uh, fertilization. The, the principle is uh, that in many areas of the ocean um, uh, are not productive enough. Um, they have uh, lots of uh, macronutrients, but they lack uh, micronutrients such as iron. And the idea is to provide iron uh, to increase primary production and hopefully export uh, more carbon. It is, um, we know it works in the surface. There are maybe 10 experiments have been performed uh, so far in the field, uh, uh, producing blooms that can even be seen from space. The big question is how much is exported, first point. And the second point is uh, some models suggest that uh, Increasing uh, ocean uh, carbon export in some areas will lead to suboxic uh, zones. Uh, so that is not uh, so good news. So increasing the sink, um, except uh, coastal vegetation, there is no bulletproof uh, option. Question? OK, thank you. Thank you, Jean-Pierre. <clears throat> and increasing bicarbonate, nuts, how do we do? So the idea of ocean alkalinization is to um, provide alkaline minerals, calcium carbonate, olivine, um, so either in um, solid form and uh, in order for them to dissolve, and dissolving those alkaline minerals is, is uh, provide CO2 uptake, uh, increasing total alkalinity, so increasing the uh, bicarbonate, mostly bicarbonate uh, concentration, or uh, to put it in a liquid form, um, like dissolved already in water and distributed uh, in the ocean. There, there are many, this is the, the, the mitigation approach that is the most uh, looked after uh, so far, and there are many projects, uh, like uh, the US Senate has uh, voted a law uh, providing 30 million US dollars for projects on ocean alkalinization. Uh, there is a big German project also, uh, marine carbon dioxide removal, looking at, uh, at this thing. And um, we have the concern that uh, uh, nobody knows uh, what are the negative consequences of increasing uh, alka ocean alkalinity. It, it will be beneficial for ocean acidification, as I said. It will counteract ocean acidification, but uh, what will be the other uh, impact? So at a small scale, at the Prince Albert II of Monaco Foundation, we are funding a project uh, on looking at in benthic mesocosms on land, looking at the impact of increased uh, total alkalinity um, uh, on um, benthic uh, communities. So right, I'm, I'm here in the back. <laughs> Sorry, so um, thank you for this presentation. Um, so my question is, in this changing future ocean with the rise of all these anthropogenic pressures, do we need to be worried about marine diseases? Maybe marine diseases of epidemiological proportions. Must be, what is your perspective on that? I, uh, I know next to nothing about uh, marine diseases, uh, nor their uh, uh, Transport, I, I just know this uh, Vibrio cholerae story that was uh, in fact transported by uh, marine ships um, from, I don't know where, to uh, the US uh, east, east Coast. So the increase in transport, transportation is uh, ob obviously uh, a mechanism for uh, transportation, but uh, other than that, I don't have a, a, a personal e expertise uh, to answer your question. I meant diseases actually not of humans, but of organisms algae and, and animals and invertebrates. There are so many diseases seem to be coming up. Sea star wasting disease and coral tissue loss disease, um, sea, uh, seagrass wasting disease. Is, are you thinking about these things? Myself not, uh, but uh, I know there are colleagues. For example, you mentioned corals. Uh, there is uh, coral bleaching is often, uh, most of the time, due to uh, increased uh, temperature. 
but the Israeli colleagues have shown that uh, there is coral bleaching occurring in the Mediterranean as a result of a Vibrio uh, infection. Um, so clearly, and, and this is promoted by increased temperature. So it's an indirect effect of temperature which increases the uh, pathogenicity of uh, Vibrio and which leads to uh, coral bleaching. But uh, I'm sorry, I don't have any more. If I can maybe say as a microbiologist, it's what's on my agenda, on our agenda, there's all these microbes around and temperatures just increasing. I mean, I could see how systems would turn into an unstable dysbiotic state and I wouldn't be surprised if we see more diseases in the future, which is um, not a nice way to end the session, but I no. <laughs> wanted to make this point. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much.